Hey everyone, I just pushed out update 2.0 for the dialogue component. On the surface, it doesn't seem like much has changed, but there's actually a lot of stuff that's been added, and we're going to take a look into that right now. Aside from new logic being added, I've also built out a little showcase level that uses everything in action, so I'll be jumping around when showing how things work. We'll start with changes to things you may be familiar with. Everything has been redesigned into structs to better organize all the values into the respective sections. Not only that, but some of the same structs have been added within the branches, allowing you to have greater control over your dialogues. A new use global variables bool has been added, which if true, will set all the branches to use these settings here. If false, each branch is going to use its own settings. I've also added several functions that will allow you to copy the global variables that you set here to all the branches. This is useful because some of the default values for the branches may not be what you want. In the documentation, I use the example of the instant text variable, which is false by default. If you're using branch settings and say you want instant text to be true for all your branches, you'd normally have to go through each branch and set the variable manually. Now you can set the values in the global settings, then click this button here and it's going to apply it to all of the branches. From there, you can click this button and apply the instant settings to your actual blueprint to make those changes permanent. One thing I'd like to mention is that I've had some issues when using this feature with the camera settings, and I think it's because you're designating a camera from the editor, and when you're applying it to the blueprint, it can't save the specific camera, and it may give you a save issue. Next, the condition system. The system itself is the same. The only thing I've added is that now you can use the deduction system alone without having to change the branches. The name is changed as well from deduct to modify because if you're using condition check to change branches, it's going to deduct it and if you're not, it's going to add it. So for things like shops and quests, it's going to remove that value from the player and for things like relationships, it's going to add it. Think of talking plus one or love plus one. It's meant to help influence the dialogues as they happen. Now, what if you're thinking, hey, I need to do the opposite. I need to add or subtract in the reverse situation. Well, you could simply just add a negative and it's gonna take care of that. Okay, so the next thing is the autocomplete. I've added to this a lot more. Now there's a timer bar and a numbered countdown, which you can toggle and some other settings. One thing I wanna touch on are the hide buttons and the disable input bools. In short, these things here can determine whether or not your dialogues turn into quick time events or act as a cutscene. For example, if you're using the countdown timer but you allow player inputs, you have a timed choice, but if you hide them and you don't allow input, you have a cutscene. Another new feature is the auto start logic, which allows you to trigger dialogues either on begin play or on overlap. And you can even trigger another actor's dialogue when you overlap this object. Just do one though, even though it shows that you can add a bunch. The showcase starts by showing you text, which is launched automatically, so this is begin play, and then the cutscenes and tutorial sessions begin when overlapping these areas. We can see how it's useful for working as a notification when the player can still move freely around, or or for triggering cutscenes. They're also skippable if you set things up correctly, which I've set in the opening radio dialogue. Unless the player is making any choices, I typically use this in conjunction with autocomplete or the dialogue is going to get stuck. And this ties into another thing I want to cover, which are these unique variables. The destroy section allows the actor or interaction ring to be destroyed once it reaches a specific branch. This helps ensure that once the actor is fully done speaking, it's not going to get triggered by the player again. This is useful for tutorials that show controls or NPCs that talk one time. The other is the activator, which is used after intro for this actor here. Once it's done with the branch, it triggers the second actor, which starts the radio dialogue talking to the player. Of the many example characters my asset comes with, another one is the alt button character, which allows you to use up to four buttons to pick four choices. By default, I have set up numbers one through four for keyboard and each of the controller face buttons. To use it, use the alt button character that I've made and either duplicate it or make a child and build off of it. Some important things is that it has the alt button widget, some other logic and variables that allow it to work compared to the other NPCs. Aside from that, you just gotta set use buttons to true and then under the player choices, assign different slots for each response. If you add multiple choices but forget to change the inputs, then it's not gonna work. By default, one is left 
two is up, three is right, and four is down. And the controller is each button respective of its direction. And you could change these within the character's blueprint, alt button inputs. I've also set it up so that if you don't pick a choice during a countdown, it's gonna pick one at random. Another new feature is the BP Moving Actor. This actor performs many functions like moving actors around along a spline, working as an interactable, or my favorite, as a cinematic camera. It comes with a lot of powerful tools at your disposal, which can be used in many creative ways. The intro uses the fade to keep the screen black, and the begin play actor fades the camera in from black. The cutscene that triggers shortly after is using a camera of the moving actor, focusing on a helicopter which is also controlled by its own moving actor, and then switches the targets to look at the player character. The door opened by the key, as well as every cinematic camera, is also controlled by the moving actors. They have the ability to switch between camera targets, as well as adjust focus during dialogues, and allow you to change branches of actors to make reactions. So I highly encourage you to play around with the settings as you can achieve some really high-end results. Another set of actors I've made are the BP player location and the BP camera tracker. Before, to use the player location settings, you just needed to have a static mesh actor with the name location and the player would snap to it. But issues kept popping up once I started to make these complex actors, so I've now made this player location component that you can add instead. It operates the same way, wherever you put it, the player will snap to that location and rotation. For the BP camera tracker, I made this because of the moving actor's ability to change look at actors. Part of the logic allows you to add camera offsets, which is great if you're sticking to one target, but if you're switching between two, what works for the first actor may not work for the second. So it has logic built in so that if your target has the camera tracker attached to it, it's going to focus to that specific point of the actor. The save system I've built out allows you to resume dialogues from where you left off if you go to a different level or even close the game altogether. It will also store the player's condition values and locations of all actors that have the dialogue component, even the moving actors. Currently, the moving actors will only save once the spline has ended. I'll add it to eventually be able to save at any point in the spline in the future. By default, the save system is turned off, but it can be turned on by setting the bool to true within the dialogue component. Even though it's off by default, the values are still being stored within the save game blueprint struct, allowing you to utilize the data in other save systems you may have already had in place. The next change is the UI customization. Before, it was really bare bones, but I was finally able to get it to more of what I imagined initially. You can adjust the color, alignment, padding, images, and there are a few drop downs that will adjust things to default positions like buttons being on the left, centered, or right, or the text box being high, mid, or low. But even more, you can now add to the location with offsets so you can really specify where things are without having to make changes to the actual widget blueprint. Another thing I've added is basic debugging UI. It's still activated with the T key, but will now show more details on screen, like the controls, the player's current keys and values, along with the current branch settings. It's currently very basic, but I'll be dedicating more time to this to make this debugger look much sleeker. A few things to note, I've added logic so that if dialogue is happening but the player goes out of range or is in the air, they'll still be able to complete it, which helps avoid dialogue from being stuck on screen or not completing. Part of the logic is with this bool here, allowing dialogue if falling. It's off by default because in most instances, I assume you have dialogue where the player isn't moving. However, if you allow dialogue at falling, you want to be careful if you're disabling movement of the player or NPC. In dialogue settings, there's a drop down disabling and enabling movement, which will cause your player to stop moving entirely. And if they're in the air, they're going to get stuck there. So for tutorials and notifications where the player is able to move around, it works well. But for serious dialogues, it can cause an issue, so you just need to make sure you plan accordingly. You can use the player location settings to snap them to the ground or something else. I haven't figured out the best way to disable player input while avoiding this issue, aside from adjusting more of the default input logic, which it isn't anything complex, but it could confuse newer users to Unreal. 
Another small change is that I modified the default sounds from the chip tune to these cleaner, quieter sounds. The original ones are still there, and you can switch them back if you want. I've also added some voices to a few of the characters. Would you like to open a door? Take as long as you'd like. You don't have enough peasant. I was gonna do all of them from the demo level until I realized it's a very long process as I'm using a voice generator that I pay for. But yeah, that's all I have for now. I hope you found this video helpful. Please let me know if you run into any issues or if you have questions. As always, if you have suggestions or things you'd like to see added, just let me know. I'll see you in the next one. Bye.